I guess this will be a recurring trend until I complete the aforementioned Fist of the North Star video. Two of my previous uploads were about my original character designs with the second video being prominent about my switch to digital drawing via Clip Studio Paint and a Wacom drawing pad. In that upload, I revealed certain female hero characters with much praise for a particular Sukeban. Or is she a Bancho? No, she's the Sukebancho! And the comments confirmed she was mostly everyone's favorite. If this was an anime character popularity poll, she'd be the winner. Which made me both happy and sad because I wanted Yuvia to win. No one talked about her. She was the illustration that I spent the most time on. I also thought the shark gun was the most creative thing ever. For this video, there will be more designs, mostly female. I only drew two guys. Well, only one of them is new. But if you like the Suke Bancho, then there's someone on par with her, which will be the last featured character. Because I spent eight hours non-stop drawing her. I even got bloodshot eyes and a red knuckle. Unfortunately, instead of finishing and correcting these drawings, I ended up making new characters. To clarify, I want to make a post-apocalyptic story where supervillains have conquered the planet and killed most of the superheroes. Imagine Fist of the North Star mixed with Violence Jack and Berserk and a couple of other things from both East and West. I'll address influences when possible with the illustrations. To make this simpler, the universe of this story is called Deadly Hearts, which is made of different series. The characters featured here are all villains with some having biographies. Unfortunately, the bios for two of them are too risque for YouTube. Well, maybe. If people can talk about Berserk in all of its glory, I don't see why I can't. Wait, can people even talk about Speed Graffer? Because that show has literal fetish powers. All I know is some of these villains were former superheroes turned evil. But all of these villains' costumes borders on... Fetish. The intent was inspired by the bandits from Fists of the North Star, who were influenced by Mad Max 2, the World Warrior. However, North Star didn't emulate the sexual nature of these Mad Max villains. Well, the live-action movie kinda did for one scene. Mad Max 2 has some kinkiness to it and I thought it would work for a team of villains. Enemies who are almost non-redeemable and linger on demonic. I imagine demonic villains could either appear monstrous or sexually alluring, but they're perfectly capable of abuse and other types of bodily harm. I believe there's a strong theme of having former heroes falling under the might of evil and becoming evil themselves. I guess that's where the Berserk influence comes from via Apostles and God Hand. And some Devilman thrown in there because that will always be a part of me. This particular team of villains are called Dreadcross. In their earliest conception, they were originally a group of vampires called the Red Cross. But I pulled back because I thought the name may lead to some complications and they weren't exclusively vampires anymore. So I felt the pun wouldn't work either. Despite the changes, many of the ideas remained the same as the old vampire concept. Prior to the apocalypse, Dread Cross was a criminal organization primarily responsible for drug and human trafficking. Dread Cross relied on dummy companies that sold legal products often regarding sexual protection, stimulants, aphrodisiacs, adult toys, costume, dating apps, streaming apps, etc. But this was all a cover to sell smut films, weapons, steroids, and people. Dread Cross had doctors and surgeons in their pocket who would tattletale the personal info of their patients and would likely end up kidnapped or worse. Dread Cross are known to harvest organs, blood, DNA, and bodies of regular humans. But their true targets were always superhumans. A discovery proved that it was possible for a superhuman to obtain more than one power via an organ transplant from another superhuman. Therefore, these villains sought out to kill or kidnap these people, including superheroes, and steal their super organs. To make this possible, the Red Cross would need strong or skilled members to either kidnap slash kill superheroes. And that's where their ties to the criminal underworld come in. Dreadcross have assassins of their own, but would sometimes hire killers outside of their organization. However, there was also the tactic to blackmail superheroes. If they managed to cover a hero's secret identity, or other secret, they would kidnap their loved ones and coerce the heroes to do their bidding. But Dreadcross were very lucky when some noble character willingly joined their side for self-gratifications that they can't show to the public. Example, a superhero secretly has a need. If this hero promises to look the other way, then Dreadcross can provide him with his preferences. But why does Dreadcross want to steal super organs or get people on their payroll? This was all done for the sake of recruiting big time players for their team and make themselves big and strong enough for a global attack. 
The plan is to get rid of the heroes once and for all, and kill any opposing villain factions that get in their way. The plan was instigated by the Dreadcross's master, Gore Visceral. Gore's plan is to bring absolute freedom, where human vices can be done out in the open and not worry about judgement. And the shocking part is... They succeeded. Dreadcross reduced the hero population to an endangered species. But now, Dreadcross have two strong villain factions to deal with, but they're very confident in their eventual supremacy overall. And that leads to the survivor heroes that I showcased in the previous video. That's not all of them, just some. The male heroes are very personal to me, I gotta work on those. Right now is all about the Dreadcross villains that I've done so far. I've actually shown Master Gord Ristoro a long time ago but I haven't done the full body. Surprisingly, most of the illustrations here consist of the full form being almost 100% done. The last villain is the one I'm sure everyone's gonna like, maybe even more than the Suke Bansho. <laughs> Foul was an ex-boxer who got kicked out of the WBA for his foul play. So, he dived into the criminal underworld and challenged the lethal underground tournament, where he also lost. Losers tend to be killed. To save himself, Foul volunteered for a new steroid made by Dreadcross, and became an underground contender. However, he had to constantly take multiple shots for the drug to become permanent, and even when he finally dominated the underworld ring, Foul still wasn't satisfied. He begged for more dosages and more power. Once he successfully proved the effectiveness of the newer Dread Drugs, Foul officially joined Dreadcross and returned to society. During a championship match, Foul interrupted the bout and brutally killed both boxers with his bare hands. He then stole the championship belt while gloating his presence to everyone, and then ran off to whereabouts unknown. Slowly but surely, Foul would make the headline news through sudden killings. Fall sought out the private lives of the champion boxers and attacked them in their homes. He successfully killed the best boxers of the world and stole their belts. With his goal accomplished, Fowl set his sights on higher targets. Superheroes. In the present day of the post-apocalypse, Fowl continues to play with his body, not realizing he's now a drug addict. He's a very competitive villain, but a sore loser. Despite being a strong individual with a superhero body count, He's not in the top 10 of Dreadcross's ranks. Those elite few look down on Foul as their burliness are naturally gifted. Foul refuses to be labeled inferior, so he takes more experimental types of Dread drugs to increase his strength. When he's not doping, Foul likes to take out his frustrations by hanging slaves in chains and use them as his punching bags. Filled with jealousy and a boxer's hunger, Foul may end up attacking his own kind. Whether he succeeds in these fights is still up in the air, but none of that will matter if an overdose knocks him down first. The word Kamisol once referred to straitjackets, therefore, this character is wearing one, and that's also her name. Kamisol was intended to be the obligatory crazy team member, but ended up being a skilled killer. Her roots reside in a secret temple where she was trained to ward off evil spirits via mystic arts. However, Kamisol had different beliefs and manipulated those malicious phantoms for her own purposes. After succeeding as the top pupil of her mystical craft, she was awarded an ancient scroll. With the secretive scroll now in her possession, Kamisol immediately killed her master and fellow students. Once she mastered the contents of the scroll, Kamisol became an assassin for hire where she eventually accepted being part of Dreadcross. In present day, Kamisol's proficiency of spectral kinesis is so great that it must be sealed, therefore she wears a straitjacket. However, by undoing multiple belts, the more evil specters she unleashes. And she's capable of so much more. But what is the true extent of her will? What are her goals? That remains a mystery. All the master needs to know is Kamiso will get the job done. One of my favorite series is Kinikuman, which is filled with some of the most ludicrous designs in all of anime. But I became fond of these dumb-looking Joji, especially when they somehow managed to pose a threat. Kinikuman also has cool-looking characters alongside the villains called the Akuma Chojin, or Devil Superman. This following character is a tribute to Kinikuman, which is a combination of the series' campy silliness and its devilish forces. 
Here's my fan-made Akuma Chojin, Slasher. This gigantic woman is an ancient living scythe from the Age of Blasphemy, the very first time period of this earth. During the medieval time of blasphemy, numerous battles of sword and sorcery ran rampant across the planet. This farm scythe was a witness to countless bloodshed that it became alive when endowed by black magic mixed with the blood of innocent families. Corrupted by the cruelty of the Age of Blasphemy, Slasher killed anyone or anything with glee. Since she's made of grudges and old magic, there's nothing she can't cut, nor can she be harmed by physical means. A wise old man once said, Magic must defeat magic, and this is true for Slasher. Long ago, Slasher met the would-be leader of Dreadcross, and they have been best friends ever since. In present day, Slasher is the most loyal member of Dreadcross and one of the top 10. Specifically, she's the master's number two guy, I guess. While her vigor and friendly attitude makes it easy to get along with her, Slasher should not be trusted as her fealty is solely to Master Gore Visceral. Because of this, other Dreadcross members try to stay on her good side, whilst keeping their guard up. While Slasher won't randomly kill, if she was ordered to do so by the Master, she'll do it no matter who or what it is. Conversely, Slasher would also protect the Master, assuming if Gore ever needed protection. These next two are Thu and Dober Woman. These are villains who ended up being a pair in an abusive relationship. However, I'm prevented from providing all of the specifics of their mindset. Thu's origin is intentionally mysterious as fellow Dread Crosses speculate he might have been a superhero turned evil, given his immense strength and stature if he were a criminal or a regular guy. There's no way Thu would have gone unnoticed. Being a superhero is the only place where his gargantuan frame would have blended in. To add validity to these rumors, there are some MIA superheroes that match his build. When other Dread Crosses asked about his past life, Thu gave no response. One day, when asked the question again, Thu suddenly grabbed the Dread Cross with a single hand and crushed him into a bloody puddle. Henceforth, no one bothers asking him anymore. Meanwhile, Dober Woman was a superhero but ended up falling hard from grace since she succumbed to her desires. The graphic content revolving around them is very berserk in nature, and if you know about this type of roleplay, then you can put the following pieces together. Thu and Dober Woman are semi-inspired by Wonder Woman's early period in her publication. I like Wonder Woman, but her conception is something I really despise, especially with all of the behind-the-scenes adultery. Despite my disdains, I found a way to incorporate that into these villains. Instead of the Lasso of Truth, I gave Thu the Chains and Shackles of Submission, which are nigh invulnerable. He tends to wrap people by the neck which weakens their powers and they're caught in a trance to obey Thu's demands. Over time, Thu has made a collection of men and women, and Dober Woman is part of it. However, Dober Woman is not under a trance, she's doing this willingly. And because of that selfish demeanor, she's putting various lives at risk. Dreadcross's main base is a castle which contains numerous slaves. Both Thu and Dober Woman are in the top 10 of Dreadcross. Given her strength and former life as a superhero, Dober Woman could easily help slaves escape and kill other top tier Dreadcross members, but she won't. If Dober Woman's identity was seen by a civilian or another superhero, they'd be in tears and utter disgust at what she's become. Whether she can be redeemed is unconfirmed, but I have plans for Thu's defeat. Thematically, Thu needs to be beaten by both genders. A female must break free of his chains and trance, while a normal man must kill him. The idea for Thu is to be superficially superior, therefore he won't view a regular human as strong. Actually, he doesn't even view people as humans. Thu is somewhere in between an Apostle and a Batman villain, and I guess a vintage Wonder Woman villain so I wasn't sure how detailed I can get into his crimes. It's also a challenge as a writer to not make it too crude. There's still one more sketch, but I didn't expect to write such dramatic things when making the character descriptions, so I'm sorry if I give you a tonal whiplash because for this last character, I got nothing. I have a very good sketch, but that's it. I have no backstory, no ideas how the powers work, no goal or motivation or past crimes. I'm drawing blanks. And I think it's because I ended up writing so much one right after the other in one night. They all sound so interesting, 
some even have potential for story arcs. And the odd part is, it just flowed naturally. I didn't create Doberwoman with an intended connection to Thu. It's only when I started typing that they became intertwined. Now, I'm trying to force some good idea with this last character, and it's not coming. It's also 3 in the morning when I'm typing this. For better or worse, here's a design that took me about 8 hours to complete in a non-stop process. If you don't like her, you can tell me, but I'm pretty sure once you see her, you're all gonna forget the intense things I wrote about. This character is in line with the naughty costumes, but she also has a lot of visual appeal. It was supposed to be disgusting to look at, but I ended up making it look cool. For some reason, many of these dread crosses don't look scary or crazy, and lean towards stylishly cool. Very evident with this final sketch because this is the most comic book thing I've ever drawn in my life, and I'm proud of it. I will be showing you the sketch in different stages. I'll end by asking you these last two questions. Flagged. She's called Flagged because she's inappropriate. Originally, the name was supposed to be Flagellation, hence the whip arms. But something about that word didn't sound right for a name. I guess there was Flagellator, but nah. So I ended up shorting it to Flagged, as it still invokes improper conduct. Aside from a tough fight, I don't have anything planned for her. I don't even know what her demeanor should be. Given her costume, there's an obvious way to write her, but I feel that's a little cliché. Flag was intended to be a minor Dreadcross, maybe not even top 10 material. But after making her look like this when compared to the first sketch, yeah, I gotta do more with her. I even drew her in a pose and she might look cooler in black and white. This ended up becoming a boss character, not a disposable beat-em-up henchman. Ironically, because of my determination to make this sketch look good, I'm now challenged with a greater obstacle of writing a character that can last multiple appearances. I guess this is like rewriting Mr. Freeze. But admittedly, I shouldn't be thinking about this right now. Instead, I should place my focus on the beginning of the series. We'll see what happens in the future. I also hope my content becomes good, and that's the reason why people stop by. Because I don't want to end up being called the guy that draws the pinup swole girls. I want to write a heroic drama, but I somehow end up drawing things like this. That's it for this OC installment. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you to my patrons, and maybe next time I can finally reveal a proper anime video. My name is Alex, and thank you for watching my channel, The Anime Hero.